Good evening. That's much better. Welcome to the Open Classroom, the last one in October. And it's wonderful to see so many of you who have been here every single week. Uh, tonight, uh, we look at urban education. Uh, and uh, I think you're going to find that our two speakers will be introduced by Dr. Grogan. Uh, <laughs> I love that little chuckle all the time. <laughs> Herr Professor Grogan uh, will um, will introduce them, but you're going to have two of the true education leaders in the Commonwealth um, who are worried about people from the ages of about three to uh, 18 and beyond. Uh, I can't wait to hear this. I want to remind you about next week, we're going to turn from schools to safe streets and neighborhoods, and we have with us Ed Davis, uh, the police commissioner for the city of Boston, who can I, I can assure you, who was here last year when we did the course, uh, is one of the most extraordinary people you will ever meet. He will tell you stories about being a narcotics agent in Lowell, Massachusetts, and what he's doing here in Boston. And um, we'll have Robert Lewis, Jr., Vice President of the Boston Foundation, uh, who has thought about these issues for a long time since he was a young man during the busing crisis and one of the few African Americans living in East Boston uh, when the buses rolled. It will prove to be another great evening like tonight. Let me just say a few words and shut up because I've been speaking a whole lot this week at economic summits and housing report cards and things like that. Um, obviously, no one in this room needs to know that we consider education in the Commonwealth to be one of the greatest assets we have. But it's a very fragile asset. I mean, one of the things that came up in the Economic Summit on Tuesday, the Governor's Economic Summit, uh, was that while everybody talks about everybody should get a college education, and we heard from Paul Sagan of Akamai, and we heard from the Governor himself, the fact is a lot of our young people aren't getting college educations, and it's probably true that a lot of our full college education, full four-year college education. Uh, and a lot of our, our, no matter how hard we try, we're going we're to fall short of that, but there are still very many great training and education opportunities we should be working with, uh, with other students as well. I'm hoping our speakers, at least I'm going to ask them some questions at the end, or at least one question, is how much difference can the schools really make? Uh, these two people are making a lot of difference for reasons you're going to hear. Uh, but if you looked at uh, the chapter on education that we've assigned from the Urban Experience textbook, uh, our textbook this, uh, for this week, one of the most extraordinary statistics uh, in that entire 600 pages uh, is the following. We ask the question, what percentage of time do children spend in school? What percentage of their waking time do children spend in school? Between the moment they're born and the day they turn 18? And the answer is 17%. That means 83% of their time is spent outside of school. Well, for the most part, with the exception of the wonderful programs that I think Chris is going to talk about for young people, most children do not get much education before age five, outside of the home. And then they go to school for maybe six hours a day, five days a week, 180 days a year. <coughs> And if you think about that, then you ask the question, what are all the influences that affect children outside of school? I often love to tell the story about the most overprivileged child on the planet Earth. Um, he has two parents, both of whom have PhDs. He goes to, as it turns out, a private school that is well known in this area. He went to camp every summer for a month when he was young. He's had tutors. He's traveled the world, his home is filled with books, and his name is Josh Charles Bluestone, my 18-year-old son. <laughs> <laughs> He's had every single advantage a young child could have that I could know of. In fact, I can't think of a Saudi Arabian prince uh, who has <laughs> an advantage that he does. Now think about a young child who was born this morning at the Boston Medical Center. Um, 
and whose home, when they come home later this week, is Geneva Avenue in Dorchester. And ask the question, what can we do in the schools? What can we do with preschool programs? What can we do with the other 83% of their life? Or 60 or 70% if you took advantage of the programs these gentlemen will talk about. What can we do so that by the time this young boy or girl attains the 18th birthday as my son did last week, they will have some of the same life chances that Josh Charles Blusen don't have. Those, I think, are possibly the most critical questions we're going to ask all semester. It's about our kids, it's about the future of the country, it's about equity, and it's about justice. Paul Brogan. Well, I have the uh, privilege uh, this evening of introducing uh, uh, our two uh, guests, and uh, Barry's quite right, they are two of the most important uh, education reformers uh, in Massachusetts, which is a hotbed of activity currently. Uh, various issues in education reform are, are very much on the front uh, burner. Uh, but as Barry uh, well illustrated with his uh, story of, about uh, his son and the the baby born at uh, Boston City Hospital, uh, we are dealing with one of the most intractable problems of urban life and one of the biggest problems that cities face, even the Renaissance cities like Boston where so much has gone right in the last uh, 25 years or so. I'd like to read you the last paragraph of the uh, chapter on education in, uh, in Barry and Mary and Russell's very fine book, The Urban Experience, expensive though it is. It's really <laughs> um, and at the end of a terrific discussion and, and, re and analytical review of all the research on uh, urban education, they ask, what are we left to conclude? The evidence seems to suggest that parental background and community factors play the pivotal role in how kids perform in school and ultimately how they do in the labor market and in life more generally. Differences between the environments in many central cities and suburbs are critical because education now plays such a critical role in the labor market and in the earning potential of workers. Gaps in central city suburban school achievement can only lead to greater income and wealth inequality as education becomes more important in determining income. We need to better understand the impact of decent housing, safe neighborhoods, preschool programs, after school programs, and health disparities to better understand why the achievement gaps by family income, race, and ethnicity are so hard to overcome. As the saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child. The evidence seems to confirm this conjecture. Essentially, we need to change a lot about cities to make the difference in the success of the children growing uh, up there. And uh, you cannot disagree with this statement because the data confirms an overwhelming and iron correlation between poverty and poor results in school and poor results in school more than ever are translating into poor results uh, in terms of uh, uh, career opportunities and uh, other aspects uh, of uh, life. So in my brief remarks, I just want to stipulate a couple of things. One is that the state of urban education is very, very dire indeed. The 50 largest urban school districts have an average uh, dropout rate of about 50%. Uh, some, uh, uh, many of these cities, 16 of the 50 in all, have a graduation rate below 50% or a dropout rate of more than 50%, including Indianapolis at 31%, Cleveland 34%, Detroit 38%, Milwaukee 41%, and so on. Um, the achievement gap is uh, wide and not uh, narrowing, uh, and uh, it's a picture uh, that you can make yourself pretty gloomy about. Boston fits in that picture, even though it's a renaissance city, and even though Boston has uh, been operating its school system under very favorable circumstances in the last decade or so, compared to many urban districts which remain in administrative chaos with uh, meddlesome school committees and really an inability to even implement a program, revolving door superintendencies and so forth. Boston has had none of that, in part because of mayoral control of the 
schools. Uh, the mayor appointed a highly regarded and very seasoned uh, superintendent of schools, Tom Pazon, who was our guest last year in, in this class, could, could not be with us tonight. Um, widely admired. He stayed for 11 years. There was a lot of new money. Uh, he had a program and he implemented it with the full backing uh, of the mayor. And there were some very modest improvements. But the fundamentals, the fundamental negatives of an incredibly wide achievement gap, uh, a third of the children were reading below grade level, a third level, a, a third grade, a, uh, a dropout rate that's better than many, uh, about, about 40%. And uh, a major study uh, that uh, the Boston Foundation studied that looked at college graduation rates added another sobering statistic. Uh, Boston had been congratulating itself for many years because uh, we have a relatively high college enrollment rate of Boston public school graduates, sometimes exceeding 70%, which is extraordinary for an urban district. Uh, no one had ever looked, though, at what the graduation rate of those students were. Who was getting a degree? Well, we took a very precise look, which is now possible to do because of new data uh, uh, sources. And it turns out that um, uh, only about uh, a third of the students who enroll in college, Boston Public School graduates, obtain a two or a four year degree within seven years uh, of their high school graduation. Uh, but that includes uh, the, um, the students graduating from the three elite examination high schools uh, in Boston, which of course do much better uh, than those average. If you take out those children, you get a very different picture. And if you put that together with the dropout rate, here is the statistic that you can derive. If you are an entering ninth grader in the Boston public schools, an entering ninth grader in a traditional Boston public high school, you have about a seven and a half percent chance of obtaining a two or a four year college degree within seven years of graduation. Chicago did a similar study, their number was 6%. And they unpacked their number and they asked the question, well, what if you're a black boy, a black male entering ninth grader in the Chicago public school? 2%, 2% of those young men are going to obtain a two or four uh, year college degree. So I, though only Boston and Chicago have done this study, I think we can be confident, unfortunately, that the numbers would be very, very similar that entering ninth graders in urban systems are only going to graduate from college in single digits at a time when, as Barry uh, can tell you, uh, post-secondary attainment is uh, increasingly the key uh, to the knowledge economy jobs that are being created, certainly in the Boston region very prominently, but uh, increasingly across the country uh, uh, as, uh, as well. Now, the consequences of this continuing uh, failure are, of course, uh, enormous. Uh, uh, lifetime earnings, a high school dropout can be expected to earn about three quarters of a million dollars over his or her working life. A bachelor's degree uh, 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 recipient will be at an average of $2.3 million. So the earnings <coughs> differential uh, is uh, staggering for college uh, uh, attainment. But the correlations to other desired things like good health, uh, longer life expectancy, civic engagement, staying out of jail, having a successful marriage and family without children, having children out of wedlock, uh, go on and on and on. And of course, there's a stark difference between what college graduates can be expected to contribute to the common wheel in the form of their taxes versus uh, high school dropouts, which will be net consumers of, uh, of uh, public uh, expenditure. Uh, so this is an enormous issue. On the positive side, an organization that I'm affiliated with called CEOs for Cities has been doing work on something they call the talent dividend. That is, trying to actually make calculations about what it would mean if uh, the country or various metropolitan areas could increase the number of people in their workforce who have attained a bachelor's degree or higher. And because the income differentials are, are so stark, it's really amazing. A study released by CEOs for Cities released this past year shows that in the top 50 metropolitan areas, the 50 largest metropolitan areas, a 1% increase in bachelor's degree attainment 
in the workforce would yield a $124 billion economic dividend for the country every uh, year. In the Boston metro area alone, a 1% increase in college attainment would result in a $3.4 billion uh, increase uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in financial in product. So uh, we have every reason to uh, be concerned that the lack of educational attainment will result in a, in a, in a flood of negatives. Uh, and, but if we can turn that around, uh, the positives are, are just uh, as staggering. This issue has a particular uh, sharpness in regions of the country uh, with very low population growth, where obviously the proportion of the population that is non-contributing uh, matters uh, a great deal more. And of course, we are in one of those regions. Uh, our labor force is uh, growing as slowly as any states in the country. I think we're 48th in labor force growth. We have a very low birth rate, a rapidly aging population, and a troubling outmigration of talented young people. So if there's any part of the country that literally will not be able to afford to, uh, this continuing catastrophe that is unfolding among uh, poor, mostly minority children uh, in, in our midst, uh, uh, it's us. So if the moral imperative doesn't uh, move us on this question, um, economic necessity should. But we come back to this very troubling correlation. Given the conditions that these young people are living in and the, the, the disadvantage they bring to school every day, is it at all possible to imagine there's an educational strategy that will help overcome those tremendous disadvantages? Well, our two speakers tonight believe that the answer to that question is yes, implausible though it may seem from the data. And it's my pleasure to introduce them uh, now. First, we're going to hear from Michael Goldstein, the founder of the Match School in Bright, right here in Boston, which is one of the finest charter schools in the state and indeed uh, in the country. Uh, he designed this school as a senior, as a thesis project for his uh, work at the Kennedy School uh, at Harvard and went, went in to turn it into this uh, remarkable uh, high performing uh, school. So he represents an external challenge uh, to uh, the educational system in the form of charter schools which are spread across the nation and are, uh, are flourishing here in Massachusetts but it remains a very large question as to uh, whether there will be more charter schools or whether the lessons of charter schools will be adopted by the broader system. So Michael will speak first. Following him will be Chris Gabrielli, who I think is, is, is well known to many, uh, former gubernatorial uh, candidate, currently uh, the chairman of Massachusetts 2020, an organization that uh, Chris set up uh, to, uh, with a mission of expanding economic and educational opportunities for children uh, across the Commonwealth. As uh, Barry alluded, Chris is a major uh, proponent of uh, after-school programs and uh, that has turned into a national in initiative on expanded learning time uh, in schools. He's a former venture capitalist now devoting himself exclusively to education reform uh, efforts. So it's my pleasure first to introduce Mike Goldstein, the founder of the Match Charter. Department. It's great to be here. Uh, I see a, a former match school student in the audience, so if I, uh, if I blow it, I'm sure he will uh, call me out and correct me. Um, what I'd like to do is, for about two minutes, just explain what a charter school is. Then I want to ask you a question, and uh, maybe use that question to stimulate a little uh, discussion. Okay, great. So. Uh, Charter schools are public schools. They admit kids by random lottery. Boston has, I think, about 154 total public schools. 14 of them are charter schools. Uh, the way a charter school starts is you apply to the State Department of Education with something that's equivalent to a business plan. It says your mission, it says who you'll serve, it says 
how you'll run the school and how you'll get the kids to achieve whatever the results are that, that you claim you're going to be able to achieve. The state then basically looks at all of these applications and every year they approve a few, or at least every year in the past several, uh, since 1994, they've approved a few of these new public schools to open from scratch. So the question I want you to think about for maybe two or three minutes, you're going to start your own charter school in your brain, which just means there's a clean piece of paper. I want you to think about if you were going to serve students in Boston, and to make it kind of apples to apples, if you were going to serve mostly low-income kids with a mission of preparing them to succeed in college, Think about what are a couple aspects of your particular school. What would you do differently? You heard the stats that Paul was describing. Come up with a different way, a different approach, something that you think would work to significantly increase, particularly the college success rates of the kids who enrolled in your school by random lottery. So think of, I'm going to give you guys about three minutes to think about that. I'll call on a few of you. I'll tell you what I did. My ideas were crappy, I'll tell you that right now. So the thesis that I did at Harvard sucked, it was totally wrong, but uh, I ended up, the one thing I did right was hire a wonderful, wonderful guy to be our principal, and I'll show you a four minute video that describes what our school is now, and you'll get the idea of what at least really works uh, for the kids in our particular school. So take three minutes, if you have a piece of paper, write it down, and, and I'm going to take some volunteers to uh, talk in a few minutes. Thanks. If we were at school, I'd be like, all of your pens should be poised or moving. <laughs> Some of you, I think, are like, where am I going to dinner tonight? <laughs> I don't trust that you're... So, you know, really think about it. This is really at the essence of what these, uh, these charter schools are about. If you have a different way, what could you try to do? 